Hi, I'm Max Spainhauer. And I'm Troy McCormick. Welcome to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Welcome to Glendale Fish and Wildlife Area. Today we're going to be out using telemetry to track down some quail that we banded back in February as part of a study that they're doing here to monitor habitat and locations of birds depending upon different property elements. So let's join uh, Bud Ververka in checking out where we can find some quail today on the property. We'll always try to get a general location from our first point and just get a direction as to which way we're going to head. Um, we use a combination of triangulation and homing. Uh, triangulation is using specific points, basically get an angle, kind of a direction, and then using several other points to make kind of a, a uh, cross or triangle. Uh, homing is actually following in on the bird. And so what we typically do is try to get pretty close to the bird and then triangulate around in a small area, maybe 10 meters uh, around the bird. So it appears to be down this way. This is a, these signals, you know, we get about a, about a half mile range typically, maybe a little over. But when you get heavy vegetation, do on, do on everything in the morning, it can make it difficult. Initial tracking of the quail is conducted with an antenna mounted on top of a pickup truck, and the staff drives around the property searching for a certain signal frequency. Once a bird is generally located in an area, they then switch to a handheld unit for pinpointing the quail's exact location. Each collar has an assigned frequency, so the researchers can set their equipment for that frequency and they know exactly which quail they're tracking. Once I feel like I'm starting to get closer to the bird, I'll start to work a circle around it as opposed to going straight in on it. Now I'll also get a good perspective of exactly what location it's in um, without just bull rushing the bird. Our attempt usually is to try not to flush the bird as much as we can. Um, anytime the lack of disturbance causes less stress to the bird, less chance of predation. Um, once we get a little more accurate reading as to what the bird is doing day to day, the more we flush the bird, the more we're going to be influencing their day to day activities. I think we're fairly close to this bird here. It appears to be in the soybeans. Um, we'll make an attempt to flush this bird today. Um, this bird's a male. Uh, we don't have any worry about it being on a nest. Um, this bird's been very active in its movements, and uh, so we'll just take a look and see what the bird looks like physically, if we can get it up in the air, uh, what the collar looks like, and uh, Hopefully we can get it up in the beans. Sometimes these birds are tend to be runners in beans. So uh, we'll make an attempt here. We were out here in February putting some radio collars on quail. Mm -hmm. And today we're out in the field using telemetry tracking to locate them. Mm -hmm. Kind of review for the viewers why we're doing this and what the process is. Yeah, we're doing this study out here at Glendale Fish and Wildlife Area. And what we want to do is we want to look at the habitat that these birds are using, uh, what locations they're using to nest, where they're taking their young to brood, and then uh, based on the banding we did on these birds as well, if we're getting any mortality from hunting or, or if these birds, we can get them uh, captured next year if we're getting any carryover to the following year. Um, so what you know, we're really trying to do is um, 
see what these birds are using every day. You know, people that saw the first show were just amazed that you could put a radio tracking collar on something as small as a quail, mm -hmm. but it didn't impede their flight at all. No, no, these birds do fine. Uh, we've had these collars on, on these birds, uh, particularly the ones we tracked today. We've had them on here since early March. Uh, the female we tracked did uh, great, and um, uh, you know we had uh, she had ten young on her nest, uh, or two weeks out from her nest. Um, typically, they have thirteen to fifteen eggs, but that's not a significant loss. And um, she was actually a second year bird too. She was an yeah. adult when we captured her, so uh, she's doing just fine. And uh, we've we've had some we've lost some birds due to radio failure this year, actually and actually more radio failure than any of our mortal any other mortality like. Um, we lost a couple birds of storms, we caught some, some birds of predation. The Old Goat Trading Post in Bloomingdale, Indiana offers not only traditional fur hides, hats, and mountain man-like apparel, but beautifully crafted spirit hides. Artistically sculpted from elk, moose, deer, and buffalo hides, they are the perfect wall hanging for your home or vacation cabin. The shaved hair sculpture and original painted scenes combine to create a natural canvas and work of art. Visit www.oldgoattrading.com for more information. Life Essentials in Brookston, Indiana provides the products you need to become more independent. Products like our journeyman wheelchair provide all-terrain access for the hunter and all-around outdoorsman. Every year, thousands of people are born with or acquire disabilities. Whether your special needs are for residential, commercial, agricultural, or just enjoying the outdoors once again, we customize our lifts and mobility products to fit your needs. We're raising you to new heights. Call today and we'll work with you to take back your life. Looking for adventure? Marengo Cave has it all. Explore the underground wonders of Marengo Cave with our two easy walking tours or go on an adventurous cave exploring trip with hard hats and lots of mud. Kids will love discovering gemstones at the Cave Springs Mining Flume. This U.S. National Natural Landmark has been open to the public since 1883 and provides breathtaking views of underground cave formations. Visit us online at MaringoCave.com and plan your visit today. Lawrence County is an unexpected destination found in the heart of southern Indiana rolling hills, offering recreational landscapes, a rich limestone heritage, and unique outdoor experiences. This area is limestone country, well known for limestone quarries and stone carving heritage. It's also the home of Spring Mill State Park, geocaches, the scenic East Fork of the White River, and underground caverns. Plan your adventure at limestonecountry.com or call 800-798-0769. Follow Indiana Outdoor Adventures online with Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Stay up to date with our exciting adventures as we're out in the field filming and meeting new people. From news updates and announcements, to Twitter posts by co-host Troy McCormick. Why wait until the next season of shows when you can follow us as we're filming them? Join us online to get the most current news on Indiana Outdoor Adventures. This bird is doing what they typically do in beans and they are running. Um, this, this male, and he just pretty, pretty much is staying ahead of us. As we get close, he'll run again. Uh, and he's not wanting to make an attempt to flush. Uh, probably have to find some kind of barrier or a pathway in the beans before he would flush. So we'll, we'll make one more quick run at him here without hurting these beans and see if we can pop him up. Um, we got fly actually had one bird just the other day we were out here tracking and it did the same thing run around the beans until it did, it come across a uh, um, just a little ditch area and that bird went up popped up um, but it, it, it had maintained a good distance of about 50 yards ahead of us 
So it, it, you, you, they're pretty attuned to hearing us and knowing when we're coming. Yeah. And uh, if, we, if we take a look down here under the foliage, we can see that it's a, a lot more open under here. So it would be easier to mm -hmm. uh, take a run through there than to try and pop up through it. Yeah. Now, I mean, perfect would be if these beans, you know, maybe with the uh, no-till tend to be a little weedier, then it's going to provide a little more of food for the for the animals as well. Because there's a little more weed, I mean, a little more insects, and, you know, that's that's what they, they want. Right now, they're basically using it just as move through cover, um, but there's not a lot of food here. And so, um, you know, a perfect world, you, you want to add, maybe get some weeds in here and some more bugs, but I know most farmers don't want that. Um, also, one of the issues we have is this is great root cover this time of year, but most of the, you know, these fields are going to be completely bare come winter time when we need a little more winter cover. And uh, winter cover is something that we're also lacking. Uh, problem is once we get all the fields cleared off, it pushes all the birds just towards the fence rows, and those make for easy predatory corridors. Sure. So, um, you know, a little more, if we had a few more connections, a little more habitat maintained year round, uh, thicker fence rows, wider fence rows, um, one of our good programs is the uh, CP33 field buffers. That provides a, a much wider area along a, a fence row or along the edge of a woods that a, a bird can escape from predation. Uh, tell me a little bit about bird number two we're going to try and locate. Okay, this bird here is a female. Um, she had a successful nest earlier this year. Um, she came off mid-June off the nest. Uh, we did make a brood attempt on her. We were a couple days late, but she... On our attempt, we, we found that she had 10 young that were flighted at that time. Uh, that was 14 days out, so that's great to see a, two, a bird at two weeks with 10 young still. Um, they usually have somewhere between 13 and 15 eggs, so we can expect that she's had some loss. Um, but uh, to have 10, 10 chicks out, out there at two weeks is real good. Um, we flushed her uh, five, five days ago, maybe. And um, I don't know if Jamie could tell me, but... We flushed her a few days ago. She had four chicks with her, but at this point, we're not expecting chicks to be lose, you know, lost. We're expecting that maybe the chicks are starting to wander away. If you flush a female with the chicks, she only may have a couple with her. They may be out feeding and, and, and everything, because once they're flighted, they get much more independent. Um, now, our goal today is not to flush this one. Yeah, we try to stick away from flushing the birds too often, and being she wasn't flushed that long ago, um, we want to make sure that we don't try to flush her again. So it's more of a, just a confirmation she's still in the area. We try to confirm what she what, what she's doing. Um, she's alive for one thing is the first thing, and that's based on our signal. And our signal on her, um, we have a one beat for every 30 seconds, and uh, so that tells me that she is alive. That beat will increase if we have if she's dead. Um, and how is that determined? It, it, you get like two beeps if it's stationary for a certain amount of time? Yeah, yeah, and it, it depends on the radio. I believe ours are eight hours. So if that radio caller sits still for eight hours, and that's perfectly still, then that signal will go to a mortality. Sometimes we'll have that, we'll have what sounds like a mortality, and that bird has just been held still, maybe a, had a predator in the area and has been holding, um, or, or bad weather, and we'll, you know, we'll happen to come out and it'll sound like a mortality, and so we typically don't try to find mortality on the first day. You'll see, you'll list it as mortality and then you try to find it the next day because you may go out there and that bird may be alive again. Bud, tell me the difference of this signal that we're tracking now. This is a mortality signal? Yeah, this is a mortality signal. Um, the beep is twice the pace of the uh, uh, live signal. Basically once every second. And uh, so we're trying to track down a radio collar now it's on the ground. So more than likely the bird's been killed and the collar has come off. We've had some 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 of these collars here, uh, this new kind we've got, have actually come apart. Uh, my hope is that this actually came apart and we don't have a dead bird. Um, the habitat doesn't look like a place where a predator would take this bird. Um, it's not for a raptor kill, it would be underneath a tall tree. Um, it's not on, right on the edge of an opening where we usually find a, a, a mammalian kill. 
and you've actually taken the antenna off and, and you're just using the, the cable I notice yep that allow you to get uh, uh, more direct signal when you're needing to get up close yep yeah we uh, more signal we take off you know taking the antenna off which is just pulls in just too much too much strength and I'll keep turning it down um, one thing we can try always is is you if you could step on the collar too somebody she touched the collar so it's just gone to a regular signal either I'm standing on it or it's right in here but one of one of us has stepped on it here because it got quieter yep That's it. Yep, and that color has come apart. See how the antenna has separated? That's the reason we're picking up such a poor signal with it, is we're actually picking it up from that as opposed to the antenna. The antenna is actually broken off. Um, this was the same failure we had on another radio collar. So this bird is not going to be counted as a mortality. There's no damage to the collar uh, itself. No, um, we no see that marks, there's or... no teeth marks on here. Um, there's no feathers laying where the bird this bird just probably come across as this bird was moving through here this collar just come apart which is is always a better thing but it just means that we're one we're down one less bird um, for tracking purposes but yeah. it may be still alive it, let me hear that what the mortality of course it, it, you're moving it now, I've moved so, it yeah, now yeah, so yeah. you're no longer get the mortality of that double beep now we're back to our single beep forever or our beep for every two seconds, two seconds. and uh, but that's 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 what's happened with some of these new collars we've gotten and um, this was our se second remaining female, which is disappointment now, so we know we won't have another brood captured this summer. Yeah. So, but at least she's still alive, and she was using this area. She was actually in the process of egg laying out here. Okay. So somewhere in this field, she's got a nest going. When you're trapping the birds, these are live catch traps uh -huh. that you've baited. Uh, then you're able to catch them. We collar them, and we release them back into the same area where they were trapped. Yep. Okay, and how many did you trap? How many did you collar? How many have you got left this late in the year? Um, well, we actually, we trapped about uh, a little over 30 birds. Um, we collared, I think around 21, 22 of those birds. Okay. Um, we had a bunch of males come in towards the end. We were hoping to get some females, so we were holding on to some radio collars for those, but we didn't catch any more females. Um, but we ended up with a fairly even split of males to females. Um, and then... What ended up happening is we lose, we, you know, you lose a few birds of predation, particularly in May. That's a, it's a high predation month um, when the coveys break up. Um, our coveys here broke up uh, right about the end, of, probably the first week of May was when really the coveys broke up. Um, and then we get high predation then because these birds are on their own. They're moving. They're trying to find mates. Um, so we got some predation. We lost a couple in those severe storms we had this year. Right. Um, Ice and... Well, I mean, and not so much, the, I mean, with those tornado the weather, the tornado weather like, that we yeah. had come through. Yeah, we lost a couple birds then. Um, but then the radio failure has been what's been hurting us the last month or so. And we lost eight birds due to radio failure in the last month. So we're down to actually currently three birds that we have signal when for. When you say you lost birds, you just lost the ability to track them. Lost the ability They're to track still them. still out there. Yeah, we actually have one. And actually today we're at a nest of, of one bird we had. We had lost a signal on it. She had been on a nest for 21 days which is right about the time for them to come off. 21, 21 to 23 days is when they will take their chicks off the, off the nest and the birds will hatch. So at 21 days, we lost her. So I come in on the 22nd day and uh, we couldn't find her. And uh, I you know, didn't know what was going on. We talked about getting a helicopter, maybe find them. And, uh, but I, I, I came down here to the nest where she was at and walked in and flushed her right off the nest, saw the collar ran on her neck. Yeah. So we knew we were having some radio failure. At that time, when I flushed her, though, her chicks were actually hatching from the eggs at that point. Wow. Okay. Um, so, and she only had she only had a brood of about five eggs. Okay. So she was probably a young bird. Yeah. Um, this may even have been her second attempt at a nest. Yeah. I'll have to look back at our data um, from what our intermittents were getting, but she may have tried to make an attempt before. If, if they do it egg laying and in the process of egg laying on that first round, um, the nest gets predated or she starts to sit and all of a sudden you get a storm and it floods the nest out, then her, the next, the preceding nests she creates are going to have fewer eggs. She always have the, that first nest is always the highest, most productive. 
Um, well, good. Well, tell you what, let, let's go back out in the field a little bit more. Let's uh, track some birds and let's end up at that nest you were talking about. And we'll take a look at uh, uh, how you take the information from a nest site like that. Okay. Great. Hi, Jim Donlin here from Westside Bait and Tackle in downtown Indianapolis. We are one of the oldest and best stocked bait shops in Indiana. Since 1951, we've offered a large selection of live baits, including minnows, nightcrawlers, bee moth, and more, all at a low, low price. We have a complete selection of name brand rods, reels, lures, and tackle. We also have a full service rod and reel repair center, so stop on in and see us soon. For more information, go to www.westsidebaitshop.com. After serving our country, serious injury shouldn't prevent our veterans from enjoying life. Paralyzed Veterans of America works with veterans to ensure that their health care and benefit needs are met, provides assistance with career needs, and offers challenging and rewarding activities. The Kentucky and Indiana chapter of PVA is proud to provide adaptive sports for members that includes hunting, fishing, trap and skeet shooting, bowling, and billiards. Visit us online to learn more about Paralyzed Veterans of America. Here at White House Whitetails, after 20 years of growing trophy bucks, we have developed a product called Buck Bullets, a hybrid supplement. Buck Bullets is not only designed to be an excellent attractant, but also a fully loaded supplement to improve antler growth and health of your deer herd. It can be used in your backyard wooded area or in your hunting area. You too can add at least 10 to 20 inches of antler to bucks in your hunting area the first year with Buck Bullets fully loaded hybrid supplement. Cave Country Canoes, located in the heart of Indiana's cave country, offers a variety of canoe rental trips from half-day outings for beginners to two-day adventures for the more experienced enthusiast. Our canoe trips follow the gently meandering Blue River through the wooded hills of southern Indiana. Abundant wildlife and great fishing opportunities abound. Go to CaveCountryCanoes.com for more information about our canoe and kayak trips. Your next adventure is just a paddle away. Hillbilly Custom Game Calls, offering the finest and precision-made diaphragm mouth calls for wild turkey hunting. Each call is handmade and gauge-stretched for exact tension each and every time. Select from double and triple reed calls like you've never heard before. We also have an assortment of handmade wood box calls, glass and slate top pot calls, and predator calls that will make us your source for all of your custom game call needs. Look for us online at www. Dot hillbillygamecalls.com. But tell me what we've got uh, here that we're working on. Okay, well this is one of our, our nest locations this year. Um, if you, it, and we're not very far from the road. Um, that's actually typical of most nests. Uh, these birds like to be in an area where they're within about, um, I think about 80% of nests are within 20 feet of an opening, as it may be the road or a crop field. And of that, the majority are actually within about 10 feet. Um, so here on, on Glendale Fish and Wildlife Area, um, we have these areas of strips that run right along the edge of the road, so we get a lot of our nesting right up close to the road. Um, this nest here, um, small bowl, uh, was actually built in the base of some uh, um, broom sedge, and uh, it doesn't look like much right now. Uh, this has been trampled down a little bit, and it's been a couple weeks since the, the birds were here. Um, and typically, what we'll do is to, to sample the vegetation at these nests is we lay a plot. Uh, this is one meter plot over top of the nest. And each of these blocks, we look at what percentage of different types of vegetation are within those blocks. Um, so uh, this first block here, um, we'd say it's about 80% uh, uh, broom sedge. Uh, there is about maybe 10% fescue, about... 10% goldenrod, and we do that onward as we go on through each plot. Um, that helps us kind of map out the vegetation around that nest. Um, from the bowl, uh, we measure out three meters to a random location of our uh, basically density pole there of how much vegetation cover there is. And so at a half meter height, which is right about here, I look straight at that board to see from the nest bowl how much cover there is. And there isn't a lot of cover. Um, these birds like to have decent views outward. Um, this small disc here we put inside the nest bowl, and I'll give you an example of where this nest bowl was at. It's right here, um, and that was sit right inside the bowl. It's about almost the exact same size as that bowl. Um, we actually located this nest earlier this year. It had five eggs in it. 
um, and this here, then I, from that point, we do some more sampling. Um, we take a random location again and go one meter away from the, from the uh, disc, which is where I'm about right now. And from that, I look at how many of those different uh, spaces on there, which are six of them, how many I can see. And so from this location here, I could actually see all six. Tell me um, the data that's being collected, both from this study and the telemetry tracking, what are you gonna use that information for? Well, hopefully um, the information that we gather will help us to manage not only our properties, but make recommendations to, to the private landowners about what they can do to enhance their quail numbers. Um, you know, if, you, if we create enough corridors of, the, of this ample vegetation that we need for quail, then we can move birds into new areas even. Um, you know, the big factor of this was, is, is geared towards our properties and making our properties more beneficial for bobwhite quail. And what can we do on our properties, um, which we, on our properties, we do, uh, you know, we put crops in, um, we mow for, for pathways for, for rabbit hunters and deer hunters. Um, we create um, different types of habitat with native grasses. Um, are the birds using those things? Are they avoiding certain areas? And so based on this study, it allows us to take and, and look at, you know, what are these birds using every day? Um, why are they favoring the private land maybe over the property? Is there certain elements here? Um, one element we've discovered early, you know, early on and we already knew, um, but is you know, definitely coming into effect with our study is that we don't have a lot of broom sedge on our property. And if you look around you here, um, there is pretty much broom sedge everywhere. And it's a very important nesting uh, element for bobwhite quail. They love to nest in the base of these broom sedges. And it's here, and we had two nests just in this small stretch here. And uh, there was a possibility of a third in this area, but that bird disappeared before it settled down to the nest. You, you um, gotta have all those habitats combined. And know, so we, yeah, all the pieces of the puzzle. you gotta have all the pieces of the puzzle, and we know we're missing some, and that's, that's the key to, to the returning bobwhite quail, is we've gotta get all those pieces together, and then we've gotta expand it beyond our borders of maybe Glendale Fish and Wildlife Area and pull our, la our, our you know, neighboring landowners in to tell them, hey, you know, we can have a pretty good population of quail here if we can just, if you guys will do this. Um, and maybe we can provide some additional incentive. And we're trying to work at incentive programs, um, you know, working with uh, the you know, natural, uh, natural resources, um, you know, NRCS, and, uh, you know, the Farm Services Administration about creating um, you know, incentives for guys to put this type of habitat in that we're in right now. That's all we've got for today. Join us again next time right here on Indiana Outdoor Adventures.